What's up glitches? The first story in today's video is I think I was abducted by aliens last night and then we have nine more weird unexplainable stories sent in by fans. So sit back, grab a snack and let's get weird. Hey, Empty Matrix. Hi. I'm a big fan of your Glitch in the Matrix stories. I binge watch all of them. LOL. They make me so happy that a lot of us with weird experiences are not alone. Warning, these stories are long. LOL. I just want to share the first story because it's very fresh. Like it happened last night fresh. And another one. So the current date is April 14th, 2024. So background. I'm an indigenous woman. Apart from the Sioux Nation, I will not specify which tribe. And I'm not sure if you know a lot about indigenous cultures or stories or not. But many indigenous tribes have stories about star relatives slash star people, especially especially my tribe and my husband's tribe. He's Pueblo from New Mexico. His tribe slash nation are descendants of the Anasazi, which are an ancient and advanced civilization that just disappeared out of nowhere about a thousand years ago, leaving nothing behind. I think they left a few people or groups behind to repopulate. Otherwise, how would my husband and his tribe slash nation be descendants of them? LOL. There's a theory that they were working with an alien civilization and that the alien civilization took them. Not sure if that's true, but it makes sense, especially about the Pueblo's creation story about the first world where they came out of the water being slimy, having tails, and had webbing on their hands, feet, and possibly scales. Because of this, Pueblos can't eat amphibians slash reptiles because they are their relatives. After they came out of the water, they cut off their webbing of their feet and hands and removed the slime. Anyways, I think the Anasazi might have been part alien and the Pueblos have alien DNA? Not sure, but it makes a lot of sense, especially when there's so many weird UFO sightings in New Mexico, which is odd and also kind of proves the theory is correct. Also, my husband's grandmother used to work on the tribal council, and she said in some of their private meetings that they did discuss UFOs and aliens. Why? She acted like she wasn't supposed to say anything about it and was whispering. Anyways, back to my story. Story number one happened last night. Around 1.30 a.m., I woke up because of bad cramping, and I went to go use the bathroom because I had to, and then I went back to bed to go to sleep. I couldn't, obviously, tossing and turning. I decided to go on my phone for 10 to 20 minutes before I tried to go back to sleep. I was trying to doze off, which all of a sudden I see a white orb near my dresser drawers. I felt paralyzed and I also felt that something was outside and I heard a humming, buzzing or a whooshing noise. I got scared because I knew I was going to get abducted and I wanted to fall asleep before they get me. So I kept my eyes closed, focusing on trying to fall asleep. I took slow breaths for myself to calm down. I swear I felt like I was physically leaving my bed and going who knows where. I was trying to completely ignore it and I was pretending to be asleep and focusing on trying to actually fall asleep. So while I was trying to fall asleep, I saw a doorknob and decided to tell myself, okay, you see that doorknob twisted to the left left to right, left to right, and I saw like colors radiating off of it, like it was outlining my hand and the doorknob, and it was going from radiating black and white to rainbow colors. After I kept twisting the doorknob, I knew 100% I fell asleep. In my dream, I was in third person or out of my body. I saw these doctors, fully covered, like they were about to perform surgery. They have masks on, a hairnet, and blue scrubs or something. At first, all I hear was screaming. I couldn't see everything except like two to three doctors. My spirit or something, I was floating, was slowly moving from right to left, slowly but surely seeing everything that was happening. I saw that whoever they were, they took my husband and I. They were electrocuting or shocking us. I think I understood what was going on. They were testing our pain receptors, which was why they were shocking us or electrocuting us. Anyways, they were talking amongst each other and I think one laughed or chuckled, which pissed me off like a lot. I like I was furious and I decided that I wasn't going to tolerate any BS and not feel helpless. So I somehow got full control of my body and like changed. I grew bigger than what I normally am, removed all the cords that were attached to me, and I started attacking each and every doctor and destroying them, if you know what I mean. I think I removed all of them. I burst it out through the one and only door, trying to figure out where I was. Now, after I went out of the door, this is where the dream gets off topic, but I knew I wanted to wake up and was fighting to wake up. Once I finally did, I checked the time and it was around 3.15 a.m. I woke my husband up and told him everything and decided to check my body for anything and the only thing weird was the back of my head was swollen like super squishy and puffy I told my husband to feel it and I'll check on it later in the day when we wake up since I wanted to go back to sleep I decided to turn on a nightlight lol good idea 
Later on in the day, I did check the back of my head and it was no longer swollen. There's no reason for it to be swollen. I never hit my head or anything. I'm not sure why or what they abducted me for. I don't remember anything except when they were about to and in the process of abducting me. I'm thinking of getting a hypnosis session to find out more details on everything. Maybe my memory got wiped, just like how all these other alien abduction stories talk about. Okay, so the humming and the buzzing immediately to me felt like you were astral projecting and not like you were getting abducted. Like it felt like you were, because you said you felt like you were leaving your body as well and like you were in spirit and you were scanning the room. But I don't know if maybe you astral projected out of your body as like a defense mechanism because you were getting abducted. Does that make sense? And you were in astral form seeing what was happening to you and your husband. I don't know why your head was swollen, though. That's really, really weird. I wonder if it had to do with the electrocution. I'm honestly not sure. This was really, really crazy. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Let's read their second story. Hold on. Story number two. This happened last year around August or October of 2023, I think. So I've always gone sleep paralysis my entire life. The typical one where there's an evil entity attacking you and all that. Usually when this happens and I'm paralyzed, I feel the negative slash evil energy. Also, I can sometimes open my eyes for a quick second, but I see nothing except my room. The reason why I'm saying this is because in the previous story and in this story, this paralysis was completely different. I didn't feel that negative slash evil energy and I don't feel like I'm unsafe, not sure why. But anyways, same thing. I was trying to doze off and all of a sudden I got paralysis. I knew it wasn't the normal paralysis I get because I didn't feel unsafe or feel like evil slash negative energy and was questioning why. I opened my eyes and saw a super white slash bright light and nothing else. I only opened my eyes for about one millisecond and in my mind I was like, oh hell no, I'm going to keep my eyes closed and I felt like I was on this metal table thingy. At this moment, I was out of my body and I saw these three to four beings I've never seen before in my life. They were very tall and skinny and had elongated heads. They did not look like the greys. They looked completely different, possibly Arcturians. Not too sure though. Anyways, they had all these wires near me and a screen or something. One of them stabbed a long needle in the back of my head and into my brain. It hurt like hell. Like I felt it to the point where my body was twitching. Like if I wasn't paralyzed, I would have definitely reacted, grabbed the needle and removed it. But obviously I couldn't do that and I could just feel the pain and do nothing. Once the needle hit my brain, it felt like I saw all of my memories flash before my eyes. Like, you know, when someone is close to death, their life flashes before their eyes. That's what happened. And it seemed like my memories or whatever was on that screen, it looked like they were trying to look for something, like they were looking through my memories. Anyways, after that, I was trying to make myself become unparalyzed or open my eyes. And once I finally did, I opened my eyes and sat up. I was in my bed and my immediate reaction was to feel the back of my head and guess what there was a sore bump exactly where the needle was I was freaking out and woke up my husband and told him both of these instances rubbed me the wrong way like what are you trying to find why me etc etc okay so maybe that is why your head was swollen the second time because it had to do with your head again maybe they had that in your head again because you did say there were wires uh, attached to you and stuff in the first story as well also another thing so I've been having Having these weird dreams about the same being for seven years. This being is reptilian, I think, with scaly white skin and vibrant turquoise eyes. He is very big, but I can't remember what his face looks like. My last dream I had of him was around June slash August of last year. He introduced me to another being that looked similar to him, slightly shorter and having brown skin and golden eyes. For some reason, I have this eerie gut feeling that those beings from story number two were looking through my memories to see if I know slash have anything about whatever that that scaly white reptilian being is, but I'm not 100% sure. Like I said, I plan to get a hypnosis session to find out the truth and keep you updated if you want. Yes, we want. Also, I'll keep you updated if I have any strange encounters again. Love you, Auntie Matrix. I hope my story gets to you soon and hopefully I can find people who have weird experiences like me. Okay, that is a very interesting theory that those other aliens were probing you for information about the reptilians that you think you've been seeing in your dreams for seven years. This is all like super freaking crazy. I cannot wait to hear what you guys have to say in the comments, have you had any experiences like this? Can you resonate with this person? Do you have any ideas on what's going on here? Please let us know. And thank you so much for sharing your story. This one is called, did my mom's reality shift in 2007? New mom? Hi, Auntie Matrix. 
Hi. I was born in 1993. My mother was born in the early 70s. My childhood was very erratic until the summer between the school years of sixth and seventh grade. I appreciate the year I started school because it helps me keep track of time despite the randomness of my childhood. In 2001, I was in the first grade. So between 2006 and 2007 was the summer when elementary school and junior high school began. My mother had been incarcerated, jail and prison off and on until right before I ended elementary school and started junior high school in 2007. During the summer, we moved into our first little home together. It was a studio built in the back of someone's garage, one large room and one large bathroom. Our one room consisted of half and half tile and rug floor. On the tile floor side was a countertop to place our two burner electric stove with a sink and refrigerator. The other half was a rug floor to place our TV and lay our blankets on the floor for sleeping. This was our first home and from what I can remember, my mom's first job as well. I was given my first set of chores and an allowance of $5 per week. It was summer break. One day, my mom left work at 7 a.m. I got up around 10 a.m. to fold the blankets, vacuum, sweep, mop, do dishes, and make myself brunch, sausage, and eggs. I felt so grown up cleaning and cooking for the first time on my own. My mother came home for lunch around 12, stayed for about 30 minutes, and then left and went back to work. I didn't expect her to be back home until after 4 p.m. That day, though, close to 1 p.m., she walked back into our studio in a daze. She sat down on our rug floor for a while. At this point in time, I can't remember having a close relationship with my mother whatsoever slash at all, so I let her have her space and waited for her to say something while I watched shows in our Comcast on-demand sections. Xfinity, it would be called today. After 20 minutes of her thinking to herself, she started talking about why she came back home. Apparently, on her way back to work, she was passing a busy intersection in the middle of town. She had a green light, and as she was passing through, a red car hit her car, sending our little two-seater rolling. She said our car rolled and hit a fire hydrant. I knew the intersection and the fire hydrant she was talking about immediately. She told me the fire hydrant went through our windshield and into her face. She described the feeling of the fire hydrant smashing the bones in her face and her teeth being crushed into her skull. She said she blacked out and then came to all of a sudden. She was driving again one block before that intersection. She could see the intersection. She could remember the moment of impact. Immediately, she pulled over. She told me she watched that same red car speed through a red light, her green light. If she had not pulled over, that red car would have crashed into our little car, sending it rolling right into the fire hydrant on that same street sidewalk. In disbelief and confusion, she drove herself back home. Who <laughs> have chills. At this moment, our relationship completely shifted. Until then, I felt like an outsider to her life. I had just felt like an accessory to her reality. She would acknowledge me once in a while every couple of years until I was a teenager. However, after that moment, she was my true and loving mother. I became the center of her world and she became the center of mine. She never got into trouble again, never went back to jail or prison. She worked and reconstructed our reality into a stable one, unconventional at times, but stable. And she did her best for me physically and emotionally from that point on. To this day, she has stayed my biggest cheer leader and inspiration. I brought into this world a grandchild for her and still she will stand up for me even to her toddler grandchild. She told me there is no love compared to a grandmother and her grandchild. It's different, not comparable to a mother and her child. Yet if my toddler yells at me or hits me in her presence, she immediately jumps to defend me. That is my baby. You do not hurt my baby. Your mama is my baby and you must not hurt her. I love her more than anything in the universe. I do not miss who she was before that day. I have a soft spot for the child that I was before her shift. It was a very interesting, fun, erratic, and traumatizing childhood void of love and compassion. How can you have fun without love and compassion? Cousins, playing, Vegas, amusement parks, water parks, buffets, fast food, holidays, movie theaters, her ex-husband's mistresses, children, aka my little besties. I remember a lot of fun, but I do not remember love or compassion or attention. Children are very resilient. They're tough little suckers. I'm grateful I didn't have to be resilient in my teens and into adulthood. She's a God-fearing woman, and she tries to deny that memory if I bring it up. But she can never deny the memory of the feeling of her teeth being crushed into her skull, and I know it frightens her. It makes her contemplate her God-given reality for a few seconds before she shakes it off, pretending that it didn't happen. But I remember. I remember the time before she was my mom, and I'll let her have her peace because she saved me that day. I love my mom. Okay, one of a few things, right? Either number one, your mom had a premonition, like a very vivid premonition and didn't actually get into the accident. Number two, she did get in the accident and she did die. It's quantum immortality. She hopped into a very similar timeline in which she was able to avoid the accident a few minutes before. In the second theory, it could be a different version from your mom, like a slightly different version of your mom than you had in your reality. Maybe that explains the change. 
or in the first theory, maybe having the premonition or even like remembering experiencing that, maybe that just changed her entire view and it was just a like a huge wake up call moment. I'm not sure exactly what happened there. It could have been either of those things or something completely different. What do you guys think happens? Let us know in the comments. Thank you so much for sharing that story. That was an amazing story and I'm so glad that you guys have such an amazing relationship now. This one is called Time Glitch in the Woods. Hey, Auntie and fellow glitches, hi. So this story takes place when I was around nine to 10. We were living in a trailer home that sat on a cleared spot in some woods. You could see the road and everything, but the surroundings were nothing but woods slash trees. Standing on the front porch, if you looked left, there was maybe 50 foot of woods between our yard and the next. Then if you look to the right, there was an acre plus of heavily wooded land between our yard and the neighboring hay field that continues around the back of the property. Plenty of wooded area for us kids to get into and play, but still small enough to stay safe, right? We will see. Now that I've painted the picture, let's get to the story. Reminder, I was maybe nine to 10 years old. I had my friend who we will call T over to stay the weekend at my house. We loved being outside and of course my mom didn't fight us because that meant that she had some quiet time. It was a safe neighborhood, very rural and quiet. We knew all the neighbors. That day we decided to venture into the woods and act like explorers. We started out going to the left side of the yard but quickly realized it wasn't dense enough to actually spark our imagination. We could still see our front porch clear as day and not to mention now we were kind of in our neighbor's yard so we decided to try the right side of the yard. When we first entered into the trees, it was like the spot that we went to was meant for us. I don't know how to explain it, but thinking about it now, it was like a little opening for a hobbit or something. We walked right into it and instantly T said, oh wow, it's like a tree igloo in here. I didn't understand what she meant until I was able to look up and see that we were standing in literally a dome made of vines and tree limbs. It was perfectly rounded. The center of the trees under it had no other vegetation growing, just fallen leaves and a few mushrooms. It felt very odd being in there, like we were being watched and pressured to leave. I told T that it was cool and all, but that wasn't where I wanted our adventures to end. I knew there had to be more things in these woods, so we continued. After exiting that viney igloo, we followed this small four-wheeler trail that I assumed my dad had left from riding there before. It felt like we walked miles, and you know what? Even more miles. Seriously, it felt like we were gone all day. T and I even made the comments that we probably needed to hurry home because it's probably past dinner time. This was before I was allowed to have a phone, so we were just winging it out there with the time. In our adventures, we found an abandoned car with tons of empty unlabeled bottles and beer bottles. We found weird shapes and fixtures made out of sticks, leaves, and rope, and unfortunately even found a dead animal skeleton. We laid flowers for it. All the while of us adventuring in the woods, we never once heard sounds of cars passing on the road. We never heard my dog barking or my mom calling for us. So she claims she called us for 20 minutes from the porch. It was honestly kind of spooky. But anyways, like I said, we realized we had been gone for a while, so we needed to get back home. We decided to turn around and try to follow the four-wheeler trail back to an exit. Obviously, it has to exit somewhere if my dad rode in here to make them. We followed them for again what felt like forever. I think the sun had even started going down at this point. The mosquitoes weren't out though, so I could be wrong. But also how weird to be in the woods and not even get bit by a mosquito. The trail seemed to go on and on with honestly no end in sight. It made no sense. So I finally told T, hey, I don't think we're going the right way. Maybe we should try hollering for my mom and see if we can hear her holler back. So that's what we did. We both just started hollering and screaming, mom, mom, we're lost. Can you holler back, mom? But we never heard an answer back. We started freaking out thinking that we were actually lost. I also couldn't stop thinking about the fact that I was probably going to be in trouble because I honestly knew better than to venture too far. We finally found another trail that had our footprints in it. So we decided to follow it, assuming it would lead us back to the vine igloo. Instead, it led us to the edge of the road by the pasture, which, remind you, we didn't enter there. We entered from my yard, so why are both of our footsteps there? We never even seen that opening or we would have taken it. Our footsteps led us all the way out until we finally found the road, so we started running for our lives back to my house. We get inside and I'm crying and freaking out, thinking my mom had done called the cops and sent a search party the whole nine yards, but instead of finding a freaked out mom, my mom says, Caitlin, why are you freaking out? What happened? And I said, mom, we've been lost all day in the woods. We walked forever and we couldn't find a way out. We even tried hollering for you and we couldn't hear you holler back. We were so scared. She just looked at me kind of blankly, not being a bad mom, but I'm kind of dramatic. So sometimes she has to give me a minute to chill out and rationalize things first, LOL. She said, Caitlin, y'all have only been gone around an hour, two tops. It's just past lunchtime. So yeah, y'all should probably just stay in for the day. I had to explain to her that we literally walked Four hours, I mean, I had blisters on my feet, so I knew that we walked quite a bit. We watched the sun start to go down. We were certain it was time for dinner. There was no way we did all of that in only two hours. 
The sun didn't go down and magically come back out. I understand we were in the woods, so it was darker, but I mean, we almost didn't have skylight to see towards the end before we found the road. T backed me up 100%. She was just as freaked out as me. She had the exact same story as mine and even asked to go home after that. I told my mom about the igloo, the car, the trails, and everything. She didn't seem to be freaked out by it, but we sure were. We just went on about our day after that. Now that I'm older and know more, could that vine igloo have been a portal of some sort? Did us going through there make us experience time differently in those woods? Why was time back to normal when we came out? Why were our footprints on a trail that we didn't walk? I honestly have more questions than I do answers, but nonetheless, it was an interesting experience. I hope everyone enjoyed. If anyone has any answers, please help. Okay, so it could have been a portal and you could have been experiencing time differently. Also, when you said that it was like a little vine igloo and it was like a little place meant for you, but you felt like you shouldn't have been there at the same time, that kind of said to me, maybe it was a fey trap. Although I have very limited knowledge on the fey and fey traps. So if you go into a fey trap, like that? Where do you go? What happens? Because they didn't say that they saw anybody, heard anybody, any weird beings, like no weird happenings. They were just lost in some weird spot. And then they came back and their footprints were leading to a different entrance or different exit, which is like really, really weird. My question is also, did you ever go back and see that tree igloo again, that vine igloo again, or was that not there? Because I wonder if your footprints were actually the way that you really did walk, but you weren't seeing that you were seeing like the fey trap or you were seeing the weird portal. Do you know what I mean? I'm honestly really not sure. This is like a really cool story though. I can't wait to hear everybody's thoughts in the comments. Thank you so much for sharing your story. This one is called Spirit Guide Angel Encounters. Hi, Auntie Matrix. Hi. Thank you so much for telling our stories. I'm a huge fan. My name is Catherine. I'm a huge believer in angels and spirit guides. I've had several encounters but could vividly remember two of them. My first encounter was when I was about 13 years old. I was a huge fan of the singer Selena and that was when she had just passed away. I was so devastated because she was set to perform in my hometown and I was going to finally get the chance to meet her VIP and then she suddenly passed away. My heart was literally torn apart. She was my role model. One night I had a vivid dream with three angel beings. I remember them dressed in white and glowy and just beautiful. I remembered them speaking to me telepathically. For some reason I asked how it was in heaven and they told me it was beautiful and that I would be there but I had to wait. I then asked if Selena the singer was there and they said yes and they told me don't worry you'll be with her soon. I was confused. I then began crying and they handed me a baby that was white complexion and dark hair and blue eyes. They told me I would be with her soon and that I had to be good to her and love her. I woke up crying so much. Come to show three years later, I had a baby girl and she has dark hair, white complexion and blue eyes. I guess they were telling me I would be with my Selena soon. Oh, I love that they showed you your baby before you had her. Second encounter was I had neck surgery and one night I was in bed and the weather got really bad and my car was outside of my garage so I hurried out to move it inside. Yes, with the surgery and all, I was in such a hurry that when I opened my car door, I accidentally hit the side of my head. My husband was working so I was the only one able to move the car. Anyway, I put my car inside my garage and I went to bed. I began feeling a headache and I started hurting really bad. I began getting scared just having surgery that day. So as I lay down, my head and neck were throbbing so bad it knocked me out. After a while somehow, I woke up and over my bed, the AC vent was right over me. I saw white little sparks coming in and out from there. I know for a fact I wasn't dreaming and these were bright lights coming down onto me. I could just see them moving onto me and up onto the vent. I could just see them moving onto me and then up into the vent. After that, my pain just went away, just like that. This pain was so intense, I almost had to go to the hospital where for some reason the pain was gone. After that encounter, I see these little sparks sometimes when I feel pain or when I feel sad. I believe these are my spirit guides assisting me and my family because now my kids are seeing them as well. Thank you, Auntie, for taking the time to read my stories. I can definitely say angels are real and spirit guides are here to assist us when we are in need. We just need to open up to them. That is really, really cool. I've never heard of that, like those light the light sparks coming like onto you and healing that someone was definitely helping you absolutely helping you out that's really really cool has anyone else experienced that in particular let us know in the comments and thank you so much for sharing your story this one is called shadow people in my auntie's apartment 
Hi, Auntie. Hi, this is a long one. Woo! I love watching your videos while cooking, amongst other creepy videos. I've been a long-term lurker to many formats of creepy content, and recently I heard a story about a hybrid creature on your TikTok, which reminded me of my aunt's apartment in Oregon. I thought I'd share my stories. Each one of them are fairly short, so I'll give you a little context. I'm also a terrible storyteller, so please forgive me, lol. My childhood was very turbulent, and my Auntie Candy took care of my sister and I for a large chunk of my life. As a child, I was very aware of energies and, I think, spirits. The first time I remember seeing or feeling anything was in Candy's hallway. It was kind of T-shaped, with the bathroom and a closet at the top of the T and two bedrooms across the T, if that makes sense. I was at the end of the T playing hide-and-seek with my sister. She had run back into the left side bedroom as I turned around from counting straight ahead of me, were two smaller shaped all black children that ran into the right side bedrooms. I didn't feel anything beforehand, but I remember hearing laughter that wasn't my sister or my auntie. I was scared, not of the shadow children, but of the unknown. What do you mean you weren't scared of the shadow children? Chill. My next memory was of my sister and I playing some kind of game in my auntie's bedroom closet. She had a lot of cool stuff in there. It was one of those closets with the sliding doors. I was on the right side and my sister was on the left with the doors open just a couple of inches on each side. The doors kind of in the middle. It was dark and I think we had flashlights or something to cast a bit of light within. My sister had left for some reason leaving me alone in the closet in my aunt's bedroom. I had my head down looking at something in my hands when I heard a noise. It's been like 15 years so I can't remember exactly what I heard but it scared me and as I looked up I saw this all black thing. It had a bulbous head like the classic depiction of a gray alien. I was so scared that I froze. I remember being absolutely terrified and basically glued to where I sat for a good few minutes just staring at this thing. I finally gathered myself and dipped. I am still scared of open closet doors. Last memory of Auntie Candy's was a white face in a bathroom window on the third story apartment across the way from my aunt's apartment building. The windows in all the apartments were like eight to nine inches across and like a foot and a half in length. Anyway, I was outside for some reason and in my aunt's apartment complex, there were concrete paths that led to each apartment building and there were stairs on the paths to get to the building on higher ground. I was on those stairs leading up to my aunt's path. I remember looking up to a building to my right and that building had all three bedroom windows facing my auntie's building. At the very top bathroom window, a white featureless face pressed into the screen of the window. Now when I say featureless, I mean it had a mouth hole eye holes and nothing else. It looked like the Phantom of the Opera mask, but with the whole ass face. I could literally see the screen straining to keep it in the window. I ran back inside three flights of stairs to tell my aunt, but she never believed me, which is okay. Auntie Candy died in 2012, so I never got to tell her the stories as an adult, but I know you and everyone else here will believe my stories. Yes, we believe you. So you got little shadow people children, then you got some shadow alien looking creature, and then you had some crazy white faced thing trying to bust out of a bathroom across the way. There was definitely a lot going on at your auntie's apartment. Woo, thank you so much for sharing your story. This one is called, I think I was the poltergeist of my childhood home. What? Hey, Andy. Hi. My childhood home was very active with paranormal activity, and I have many stories from water dripping out of the ceiling with no explanation to handprints on the wall to full body apparitions. But let's start with my most confusing situation on how I believe I was the cause of the poltergeist activity that happened during my childhood. Okay, hold on. Because it said I think I was the poltergeist. So do you think you're the poltergeist or you were the cause of the poltergeist activity? We need to keep reading. I'm very interested. We moved into my childhood home when I was in kindergarten. The house always gave off a weird vibe. The setup was strange. Each space was very closed off from one another. When we first moved in, we found an onion in the hole in the basement wall that was wrapped in a sack. Not sure if it was a prank left by previous owners or something used to ward off ghosts, but the spot where we found the onion was a hot spot of a lot of paranormal activity soon to come. I remember once I was roller skating in the garage and wanted to show my mom my cool moves, but she was inside the house. I kept feeling like I was being watched and got creeped out, so I cut my time short and went inside. When I got inside, my mom was yelling at me for pounding on the picture window. She said she would look to see me on my roller skates, but the sun was too bright and she couldn't see anything. Another time, my brother and I were in the kitchen doing homework and my mom was cooking dinner. I remember feeling annoyed because she was cooking his dinner of choice. She walked out of the kitchen to use the bathroom and when she got back, she started yelling at my brother and I for messing with the stove. I was probably nine and he was around 14, but neither of us knew how to disassemble the electric stove top, take out the metal bowls, and then strategically place them all perfectly upside down in a pattern. Of course you didn't know how to do that. What? Convinced it was us, she begrudgingly put it back together and we were scared as fuck knowing something crazy went on right behind our backs moments before. 
As I got to be a preteen, I would get mad and go shut myself in my room and the phone would ring with an unknown number and no one would be there. It was as if I could think it to happen and it just would, just to annoy my mom. But only when I was mad or upset. The telltale time that made me think, oh my God, I'm doing this, was when I, once again was mad, I had a hard traumatic childhood, went to my room to take a nap, and in my dream, I was above our house like a puppet master. It was darkness, except for the house and its entire layout. I was striking down lightning from my finger. I began flipping over kitchen chairs and then shaking couches and laughing at how awesome this felt to do. The house was flashing, and then I woke up to my mom rushing into my room, white as a ghost. She went on to tell me how the lights were all flashing on and off, the couch was shaking, and she would run from one room to the next, and each room would have some kind of activity happening. At the time, I was like, whoa, how weird. I just had the exact dream. It wasn't until I was putting the pieces together later on in life while watching Taps Ghost Hunters where I learned about living people, mainly young girls, being the root cause of poltergeist activity. My mom got sick and passed away before I got the chance to ask her about all the crazy poltergeist activity she and I experienced living in that house. To this day, I still have vivid dreams being in that house, but it's redone and decorated how the new owners have it, even though I have no idea how it really looks today. But like all my astro traveling experiences that started in my childhood, my spawn point is always in the basement of my childhood home where we found the onion in the wall. I love your videos. My seven-year-old and I are big into all things woo-woo, so your page is perfection. Thank you. Oh my God, this is so crazy. Okay, so I looked it up and onions and garlic are, can be things that ward off evil spirits, but I don't understand what's happening now. What do you mean young girls can be the root cause of poltergeist activity? Is there like a poltergeist spirit in the house that kind of attaches themselves to the young girl um, and then feeds off of her like negative emotions? Because we all know that like spirits and entities and negative negative energy can feed off of like negative situations or negative relationships or negative things happening in a home. Is it something like that? I don't really fully understand that, but this was really interesting. And if it was a poltergeist being that was attached to you, was it like in your dreams? Like it was like doing what you wanted to do in your dreams? Do you know what I mean? Because in your dream, you're flying above the house and you're zapping things and shaking the couches and that stuff was happening like in real life. I am so confused. This is really cool. Very interesting. I'm interested if anybody has any information about this, if you know what this is, please let us know in the comments. I wanna hear all of your comments and all of your thoughts. Thank you so much for sharing this story. It was really, really cool. This one is called Baby Cradle Violently Rocking on Its Own. Hi, Auntie Matrix. Hi. I have several stories ranging from paranormal to UFO encounters, and I would absolutely love to share my stories as I feel so seen by you and your community. Yes, we believe you. I'll start with the paranormal today as it's a bit of a three-parter. There are a series of events that happened to me as a teen in my parents' old house that I cannot explain and still makes me anxious and gives me a pit in my stomach to think about. Although I don't want to think it was a malicious spirit or anything just shocking to the system to have an encounter. In 2009, I was around 15 years old. I woke up one morning expecting to go take my permit with my dad, who was the only other person in the house with me at the time. I am standing in our living room looking into a big mirror that is over our fireplace fixing my hair. For some context, my mom did daycare for 30 years and kept my brother and my old wooden baby cradle in our living room for the small babies that she was doing daycare for. I was approximately three feet away from the wooden baby cradle and all of a sudden I hear a huge boom from next to me and the baby cradle is violently rocking back and forth. I made a surprise noise as it startled me and I heard my dad start to leave his room to come over and check out what happened. When I tell you the moment I saw him turn the corner to come over from his room, it slowly stopped until it had fully stopped as he entered its sight. I actually didn't really get into details with him. I thought that he would think that I was crazy. When he left the room, I set out to figure out how the loud bang sound or rocking could have happened. The way the baby cradle is made, the whole thing rocks on two crescent moon-shaped wood pieces that are the only things to touch the floor. I tried every which way I could to prop the sides up on the nearest wall, but it was too far away from the wall to have been caught, and there were actually no way for it to be able to be propped up just based off the shape of the rockers. Nothing else happened that day, but it really freaked me the fuck out. Last year, I went to visit my parents' new house that they moved into after lockdown, and I saw my mom had brought their cradle to the new house. I then asked what the deal was with it. She apparently had made it for my brother in 1993, and since I was a surprise last baby, I used it too. It just unsettles me that something made for the most innocent would be used to bring fear out or an unsettling feeling. 
In the weeks following, I started hearing my sister or mom's voice calling me and knocking on the door while I showered. It happened about a half a dozen times and I would hear distinct knocking and a female voice calling me out and I would go out and check. Sometimes I would be home alone. Other times I'd go in and ask my sister or mom what they needed and they would be clueless. I stopped getting out of the shower after a while and I just ignored it. The, to me, scariest thing was the last to happen before all paranormal activity stopped in my life. While I was a teen, I was obsessed with photography, which was just me being a horrible photographer with my crappy old virgin mobile prepaid phone. It's 2009. Don't judge me, LOL. <laughs> so one morning I woke up as normal and decided to go through my phone pictures that I had taken the day before to edit them. As I opened my camera roll, I saw a photo that I never took have never seen, never saw on the internet, and definitely didn't save. This photo was in the camera roll that was specifically photos I would have had to physically taken as there were other folders for things like downloads or screenshots. Never one time did this happen before and I had absolutely zero problems with my phone glitching or not working normally. The photo itself was one of the strangest things I have ever seen. Nothing about it is particularly sinister until everything is put into context. The photo was clearly in someone's backyard. The way the angle was taken from was peculiar. It was as if someone walked off the back deck, knelt down, and took a photo from as low as the grass so you could see partly under the back deck and partly to the left in the background. There were two dogs in the photo. One was in the front by the deck and right where the dog is sniffing the sunshades over the deck, creating a black abyss. Next to where the first dog is sniffing the ground is a very small man's face right where the darkness of the shadows begins and enter the deck just a face like a disembodied apparition in the background of the photo is another dog standing on its hind legs as far as they can reach into the sky surrounded by orbs of light that clearly were not made by the sun as the angle was wrong the dog seemed to be interacting with the orbs of light now after a good look trying to figure out how this photo could be in my camera roll of photos i specifically had to take i had a panic attack which i had never experienced before the way in which it appeared on my phone and the sheer oddness of the content of the pictures really sent chills down my spine who is buried under this random deck? At this time, I was very much opening myself up to spiritual or paranormal experiences, just being a curious teen. And after all this, I became very weary and scared to open that rabbit hole again and have steered clear of letting those experiences into my life as if it's a choice, but it's working. I do know the previous house owner's husband died of a heart attack in the living room, which is where the baby cradle incident happened. But the picture or shower stuff just really baffled me. Thanks for letting me share. I watch your content so much and finally decided after a cup of coffee to write down the few paranormal or just unexplainable things that have happened to me. I'll share my UFO story another day and that will be a long one. LOL, bye y'all. Oh wait, there's a second email. Also just to add, I sent that photo to some paranormal investigators I found online, but my phone was such low quality, the photo could not be zoomed in without extreme pixelation. They all said it was weird though, haha. <laughs> that photo was unfortunately lost years ago on an old laptop I forgot the password to and gave away or I'd show some receipts. Sorry y'all. I'm not even sure how to connect these two things. Like how to connect, I mean, I guess it was whatever like spirit or entity was in the house that made the baby rocker shake and took the picture but like why that picture what a weird and random picture to get on your phone i don't understand this at all it is so weird but so so interesting please let me know in the comments your thoughts on this story thank you so much for sharing this one is called Unexplainable Mitten Matrix Glitch. Hi, Auntie Matrix. Hi. The winter of 2000 was a very strange one for me and my family. I have several stories that happened over a short period of time. I will start with the most unexplainable glitchy glitch that I've ever experienced. For a time, I was living with my parents in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. However, every weekend, we would travel approximately six hours south to check on the house that my parents still owned in northeastern Wisconsin. Every weekend? You drove six hours every weekend to check on a house? Usually, we would get started back pretty late and we would stop approximately halfway between between the house in Wisconsin and our rental in Michigan to fill up on gas as well as to get a couple of coffees and snacks for the rest of the trip home. My dad had a pair of choppers with us Wisconsinites call fleece lined leather mittens. Okay, I was like, what is that? Because they were really bulky, it was hard for him to pump gas wearing them. He would usually take one of the choppers off and place it on the roof of the car, fill up the tank, and then put the chopper back on after replacing the nozzle to the pump. When my mom and I got back out to the car, my dad was searching all around the car looking for his right chopper. He explained to us that he had put it on the top of the car as usual, but once he finished filling up, it was nowhere to be seen. We all looked under the car in the back seat in the driver's seats and we couldn't find it anywhere. My dad went in and left his phone number and name with the clerk just in case somebody found it. These choppers were hard to find and expensive, so if there was a chance that somebody found it once we had driven off, he hoped we would be able to swing by next weekend to pick it up. We piled back into the car and drove three hours we needed to go home. Once we got inside and started unloading our bags, my dad and mom walked into the bedroom at the same time only to find 
the right chopper lying neatly in the center of the bed. To this day, we still have no idea how it disappeared three hours away and ended up waiting for us to arrive back home. That is a glitch if I ever heard one. How did that mitten, was there like a portal on the top of the car and it just like zoop, to home? How did that even, how did that, how did that, how did that happen? How? I need your theories. Please put your theories in the comments. Thank you so much for sharing your story. This one's called What Got In Bed With Me. Hi, Dematrix. Hi. I live in the UK. My husband's best friend owns the Village Pub. About six months ago, my husband and I planned to watch a movie in bed that night. He asks if it's okay to pop down and see his best friend and have a couple of pints before the movie, and I'm reluctant. Free beer means he never only has a couple. He promises to be home by 10 p.m., and I relent. 11 p.m. rolls around, and he's not back, so I go to bed and scroll through social media on my phone. It's important to note I take medication to sleep, and it takes an hour to kick in. I didn't take the medication because I'm hoping that he will be back soon and we can still watch the movie. At 1 a.m., he finally comes home and I hear the lounge door open and close and I hear him slowly walking up the stairs. I sleep with earphones and loud music because I have a noisy brain. I am mad now because it's too late to watch the film. I quickly put my earphones in and pretend to sleep. I hear the bedroom door open and close, a cold draft, and then his weight getting onto the bed. He prods me in the back a few times, presumably to see if I'm awake. I ignore him. He rolls over and goes to sleep. I need to pee around 15 minutes later and I need to take my medication to help me sleep. I get up and my husband isn't there. I assume he must have gone back downstairs when I felt him roll over. So I pee, take the medication, and eventually go to sleep. At 3 a.m., I'm woken up by my phone ringing. It's my husband. I answer the phone and he says he's sorry he lost track of time, but could I please let him in? It's raining. He didn't take a key and the door is locked. The door can only be locked with a key and my key is in the door. I go downstairs and see his keys on the side. I don't remember locking the door, but I must have. I'm now absolutely freaking out and he thinks it's because I have to get up and let him in. I explain to him what happened and he tells me I must have dreamt it. I explain that I 100% did not go to sleep because I simply cannot without the medication. I even had timestamps on my social media right up to 1 a.m. I have no idea what walked through the house and got into bed with me. We only have one door into slash out of the house and the door cannot be opened if someone leaves the keys in on the other side. The house was originally owned by my husband's grandparents and we bought it when they passed. I'm still freaked out to this day and my husband has a strict curfew. Oh my God, that was not your husband. Do you have a mimic in your house? Did anything like this ever happen again? The weird part is that the door was locked and you don't remember doing that. Like that's weird. Oh my God, can you imagine just like you hear the person come in, you hear them walk up the stairs, you hear them come in the room, you feel them get into the bed, you feel them touch you and then you get up and they're not there. What is my cat doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was such a weird one. Thank you so much for sharing. This one is called, Does the Spirit Living at My House Have a Nicotine Addiction? Hi, Auntie. Hi. I'm writing from Drizzly, UK. I followed you for a few years now, and I just love hearing about other people's glitches and experiences. I write to you today with one of my own. Backstory, which may or may not be relevant. I'm a vapor. Please don't judge. I used to smoke cigarettes, but this is part of my journey to be nicotine free. I've always been open minded to the unknown, hence being such a fan of yours. I've experienced small things throughout my life which are unexplainable and might write in and tell you more about them. Three years ago, my partner and I bought our first home together. It's a dream, everything we wanted. Our bedroom is on the top floor, which consists of a bedroom, a storage area slash room and bathroom. Almost immediately, I could feel a presence on the top floor. It's stronger in the bathroom. However, I don't feel threatened by it or afraid. I just feel it there, mostly at night. I I feel it in my bedroom sometimes too, but I wonder if it's the same one. I think this presence is mischievous. It tried to frighten me once by slamming a cupboard next to me that hadn't closed all the way. It worked. It made me jump. I spoke out to the room in a firm and calm voice. If you want to live here with me, you can't do that. Don't try to frighten me or my family and you can stay. It seemed to work. And although I sense him slash her at night, there's no funny business until recently. I'm guessing my spirit is bored or like my title says, has a nicotine addiction. I was vaping in bed one night. I put my vape pen down. I was looking at my phone and then I reached for the vape pen and it wasn't there there. I looked at my bed and bed covers and nothing. I got out of bed and checked the floor and under the bed again. Again, nothing. I knew I hadn't left the room, but I checked the dressing room and the bathroom anyway. Nothing. 
Having a dependency on this terrible substance, I started getting frustrated and cross. My partner got out of bed to help me look. We all but stripped the bed and searched the entire top floor for the damn thing, and it was gone. I went to sleep angry and pissed off. How could it go missing when I had it in my hand five minutes ago? In the morning, I looked again in the daylight, and it wasn't anywhere to be seen. I had a feeling it was something to do with the spirit living in my house. I was still angry. I went to the bathroom and confronted it. I know how it sounds. I told it they'd cross the line. I told them that taking my things is not acceptable from anyone in the house, and that includes him slash her. I told them they had to leave. I went down to make a cup of tea, and guess what? There it was, next to the kettle, placed upright, which is weird as it's pen-shaped vape. You would lie it down if you were going to put it on the surface. I hadn't been downstairs before I lost it. I can be 100% certain of that. My partner also agreed that I had not. He doesn't feel the spirit, by the way, and he just humors me when I tell him about it. I felt bad for evicting my spirit now that it had turned up and I had a hit of nicotine, so I went upstairs and offered to let it stay if it would agree not to take my things again. I don't get replies when I speak to the spirit, nothing I can hear anyway, but I can feel agreement, if that makes sense. That brings me to today. I have a new vape pen. In fact, I have two, as I got one for free. The same thing happened two nights ago. The thing went missing and I couldn't find it. I looked again in all the same places, including my handbag. I emptied it completely and it was nowhere to be seen. I wasn't so angry this time as I have reduced my intake and also had the second vape when I needed it. I'm at work now and I reach into my bag for something else and there it was. As if it was always there when I know full well it wasn't there before. There is no possible way that either of the vape pens were misplaced by me. I wouldn't write into you if it could be easily explained away. I didn't confront my spirit this time as I actually didn't think it could be him or her after our chat last time, but I think I should talk to them again tonight. Should I ask him or her to leave again this time or delve deeper to find out why the tricks? Would I be opening a dangerous can of worms by inviting it to communicate with me? Okay, well, your spirit obviously does not have a nicotine addiction. <laughs> I think that goes without saying. I'm wondering if they're taking it either A, just to annoy you, like just to be annoying, or B, are they taking it like to make you stop? Also, as far as how you told it it had to go, like you can't touch my things in the house and then it went for a little while. I have heard that you can like clear something out of your house and it can like die down, but then it can like slowly kind of get its energy back and like do stuff again, if that makes sense. So I don't know if that's what's happening here. Either way, I mean, you could try to chat with it if you want. I mean, I don't think that it would be dangerous to communicate with it unless you are feeling that. Like go by your energy, right? Go by how you feel. Do you feel scared by this energy? Do you feel, do you feel threatened or anything like that? Or do you just feel like, like it's fine and it's just like this annoying spirit that's being annoying go by your energy and like how you feel do you feel it would be okay to chat with it or not and make sure you protect yourself if you do obviously let me know what you guys think about this in the comments and thank you so much for sharing your story that concludes our creepy compilation for today. If you enjoyed these stories, there will be more videos like this, so make sure you hit that subscribe button. And if you wanna keep going right now, you can check out this video or this playlist.